Today our meditation of God's word is taken from Matthew's gospel, chapter 5, verses 33 to 37. So please open your Bibles and uh, stay in that text as the Lord enables us to go through and understand these great words of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 5, verses 33 to 37. Join me. Let's read together. Again ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, and shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, Swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shall thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one air white or black. But let your communication be a, a, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. <coughs> Integrity of words. Honesty of our speech. It's a matter of eternal consequence. Lots of people think telling a lie is a small thing and it, it costs us nothing. But the Bible clearly says it is God's commandment that we should not bear false witness. Telling lies without repentance can make you an heir of eternal hell. We do know telling lie has caused a couple named Ananias and Sapphira their life in the early church. Ananias and Sapphira died because they told a lie concerning their gift, the proceeds from the sale of their property. Jesus is in the midst of what is known as Sermon on the Mount, one of the greatest sermons that the world has ever heard. It came from the lips of our Savior. Recently, when we went to Israel, some of us had the privilege of standing at that hillside where Jesus stood and preached. It's a beautiful place. You go to the land that is known as Galilee region. It's full of hills and a grand lake known as Sea of Tiberias or Sea of Galilee. And these names are based on various villages and towns that are situated around the sea. So sometimes it's called Sea of Tiberias because there's a village called Tiberias. Sometimes it's called Galilee Sea because the region is called Galilee. Or sometimes it's called Sea of Gennesareth because there's a village called Gennesaret by the side of it. There are several villages and towns around it. Some are fishing villages, some are farming villages. Now, when, whenever Jesus went to that area, people from all these villages and towns will gather around him. Sometimes he had to board the boat and push the boat deep into the sea so people will not throng him or you know, crowd him and squeeze him. So he would get away from them into the water on a boat and preach from the boat. This he did. Another thing what he did was to go up the mountain and people are sitting on the slope and sometimes even along the seashore. And he will stand on the top of the hill and he will talk. And it is almost like what we have uh, here. Uh, you know, the, the, one of the things that you notice when you are there is the natural uh, amphitheater that they have. The hillsides you know, having this slope coming down. And if somebody stand at the top or at the bottom and preach, the voice would just go up naturally. You don't need these mic mics or this public address system. You don't need it. it it's a just naturally built that way. God, the creator, did that. So Jesus took advantage of this. And it is in such a setting he preached this long sermon that we see running through Matthew 5, 6, and 7. 
which is known as Sermon on Mount. Now, we have been studying that for a time. Now, in chapter 5, Jesus, after spoke what is known as Beatitude, started to confront the hypocrisy of Jewish people of his time. The religious Jews tried every bit to look very religious. However, they were corrupt men. And this didn't go well with Christ. And we have been watching this, how Jesus confronted them and exposed the heinous sins of their heart. Religious men, but wicked in the heart. Outwardly, they wear the kind of robe, uh, they wear the long beard, and everything that make them look very religious. But there was nothing in the heart that pleased the Lord. Jesus, in this chapter, addresses six specific areas of Jewish sins. We have already noted three of them. Now, interestingly, each time when Jesus confronted their errors, he would say something like that you just read in verse 33. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time. So traditionally, there was this tendency to uh, subscribing certain erroneous beliefs and practices. It is not a sudden outbreak of an infection. This infection was there for a long time. For hundreds of years, they have been having this perilous problem of the heart. The hearts were not at all devout. The hearts were not at all godly. But their hearts were utterly wicked. But outwardly, they have all the forms of religiosity. They would pray three times. They would stand at the street corner and pray. They had all sorts of Religious extravagance. Now, let me just remind you the three areas that Jesus, repri rep Jesus reprimanded them. Of the six reprimands, we have learned three. First one in verses 21 to 26, the murderous hearts in worship. Jesus said, Put your offering there. Go and reconcile with your brother first. Because to hate a brother is to have a murderous heart. So he confronted that. The second sin that Jesus confronted and rebuked was the adulterous hearts that came in worship. Verses 27 to 30. We studied that. And the third one that Jesus confronted is in verses 31 and 32. We took four Sundays to cover that. Which was the treacherous conduct in marriage. Divorce was common. As long as they can write a paper, say I divorce you. And easily they get out of the relationship and abandon their wives and go on with other women. So Jesus spoke about their treachery. They often said Moses is the one who allows us to divorce. He said, just give them a bill of divorcement. Then you can leave your wife. But Jesus said, are you sure that's what Christ said? I mean, Moses said. In Matthew 19, which we did consider, Jesus said, it was because of the hardness of your heart. He said, go ahead and divorce. It's, lo it's like saying, if you don't believe me, then go ahead and live your life without faith and face the consequence. Well, if you have a child who doesn't want to study, what would you say? Give up on you. Do what you want. Go and face the music. So Moses said, if you want divorce, go divorce. But make sure it's done properly. So the poor lady will not be abused. Make it legal. But that was not a permission or a command given to go on and divorce. Somehow to organize this whole Terrible situation, man leaving the wife without any proper acknowledgement. And then the poor lady is waiting 
to see whether the husband will come back. If she goes, want to get married, then they will say, no, 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 no. I didn't divorce. Oh, we don't want such situation, so make it clear. Write the paper. So he did that. However, it was not a command to divorce. In other words, God never wanted divorce. It's the people who want the divorce. God's command, as we notice in Genesis 2, 24, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and become one flesh. And till death do us part, this relationship cannot be broken. Since we have studied that at length, there's no need to explain it further tonight, today. So let's get this right. Jesus is not pleased with our coming. He is more concerned about our heart's condition right now. Though these were confrontations of the Jews of his time, they have great relevance even today because we are not better than the Jews. Our hearts are not purer than the Jews. We are still as wicked as they are. Sometimes I believe Christians also, though they know the crux of the gospel, that you cannot be saved by works, but by only through repentance and faith in Christ Jesus, and not by works. We say that many times. So we tend to think, oh, so no need to work. Anyhow, I live, I just say, I'm sorry, I believe. No need for righteousness. Yes, righteousness is something that you cannot have on your own. It is received by faith. Nonetheless, when you receive the righteousness of Christ, your life will prove it through righteous lives. You can't say I'm safe when you continue to sin without repentance. You cannot say I, I am saved. I'm going to heaven when you would not acknowledge the sins that stick in your heart and wouldn't repent. This was the problem of the Jews. They said, we have Moses as a prophet. We have Abraham for our fathers. We had great line of rich spiritual tradition. We are God's covenant people. All the rest are dogs outside God's kingdom. Sometimes we Christians have that attitude. It's true we, have, we are God's covenant people. But if our hearts doesn't honor that claim, in sincerity. We will have a substandard religion which is not true. So today we are looking at the fourth area that Jesus confronted. The fourth area of error that Jesus tackled was a system of deceitful speech. They have developed a system of deceitful speech and practiced it with great religiosity. Let's think of these words that our Savior spoke. You know, my greatest prayer is that we realize what great lies we are and repent. The greatest deceiver is the one who deceives himself by saying, I never deceive myself. You get that? The greatest deceiver is one who deceives himself by saying, I'm not a deceiver. God and our Savior Lord Jesus Christ knew fully well that we are prone to lie. We are deceitful people. We never acknowledge the reality of our own condition. We tend to justify ourselves. We justify by putting up a religious front. So nobody will think that we are wicked in our minds. We, when we are caught, but not without full proof, would give all sorts of justification. And when we are caught, the latest line of argument I see in many situations, actually, I'm not such a person. I'm a good person, but the pressure made me say that. Or oh, that particular situation caused me to do it. I don't know why, I'm, why I did it. I regret. 
Oh, I can tell you why it is. God says it. Your heart is deceitful. Your heart is deceitful about all things. So let's don't sit here and pretend to be truthful people because God knows our hearts. We are number one cheats. And it is better for us not to make any claim at this point of time. Let the Lord speak. And Jesus said in verse 33, Again, ye have heard that it had been said by them of the old time. He is just about to strip bare the phoniness of the Pharisees. He cannot tolerate the hypocrisies of the Jewish leaders and those who followed them. Because it was contrary to the scripture. He didn't say it has been said in the scriptures. But he said it has been said by you or people of old. Ye have heard that it had been said by them of old time. And I told you five times this phrase is found in this verse. Five times. Verse 21, verse 27. You see that? Verse 31, verse 38, and verse 43. Five times Jesus picked up these lines that were commonly spoken by people. And he would say, well, ye have heard that it was said by them of old time. It was so ingrained in the society. It was in the psyche of the society. Everybody was thinking this is true because it has been said for a long time. One time, in verse 33, Jesus said, it had been said. He didn't say the whole phrase, just summarize it. So six times he confronted six areas of error. Now, this expose by Jesus Christ alert you and me to the fact that the words of Christ are meant to impact us to have a changed life. It cannot be left as it is. Our thinking must change. Our way of life must change. Our conduct must change. Because the Lord is displeased. It's not a matter of human achievement. It's not about how much we can cover our wickedness and make ourselves look good. I know of parents who have become so embarrassed about their children's behavior because they would say, I never knew my son was up to these things. I never knew my girl was about to do this. I had no clue whatsoever. Just uh, two days ago, On CNN website, my heart was so troubled reading the story of a young man of 17, 16 years old, going to 17. He killed himself by running into the highway in the middle of the night, something like 2 a.m. or close to 3 a.m., dash across the road on purpose to be hit by a truck. You know, there were a lot of trucks in the night in the States run from one state to another. They drive very fast. And he purposely ran across to be knocked down by one of them and killed. And he died. Well, before he died, he made sure that he wrote very clearly why he's going to die. Because he says in his heart he knew from the age four, though he was a boy, he was a girl. Physically, he's a boy. But he says in his heart, he was feeling that he is a girl. But the Christian parents are Christians. So on one occasion when he said, Mommy, I want to be a girl or something like that, and the boy, and mom said, no, it's not right. 
God created you to be a boy. And you are a boy. And you behave like a boy. Unfortunately, this boy's life didn't change. The parents thought he's okay. They did take him to some Christian counselors uh, who gave give, uh, biblical principles, but he doesn't want to accept. He put up a good front at home. He had other siblings. They also didn't know what's going on. But he killed himself on the 16, uh, uh, at the age of 16, and then he said, this is a terrible world. I hope people will change and accept people like this. Now, accept this means we agree they are, whatever they say is right. Now, this tendency is growing day by day in our society, including Singapore. Men saying, oh, I'm a woman caught in man's body. And women saying, oh, actually, I'm a man caught in women's body. This is the last day sign, end day sign. Or people becoming like Sodom and Gomorrah and Noah's time. Homosexuality and whatever other weird forms of sexual pursuit will only rise. And some of us are going to wake up and cry. Saying, I never knew this is what my son was up to and my daughter was up to. I want you to understand something. There is no way you and I can leave our hearts or our children's heart to its own thinking. It has to be brought under the teaching of God's word daily because that alone is the truth. We tend to deceive ourselves. A man says to himself, no, it's better for me to pretend to be a woman. And they feel it. They are so deceived that they don't realize they are deceived. And they convince themselves they cannot be a man. They cannot repent. They are made. I know of homosexuals who have repented of their sins and live a normal life. Even in this congregation, there are those who have been gays and changed, which I know. And they live a normal life. So it is not true that God cannot change our sinful hearts. But then we have a huge growing society of intelligent men, whether they are doctors or philosophers or scientists who says, oh, please understand, accept them. This cannot be changed. But I believe when God's word that is infallible and inerrant is taught from young. It's not good enough to be a Christian and hope that your children would go to church and somehow learn it. You father, you mother must teach them from young. Don't let them sit in front of all these silly cartoons on TV and watch them. All the lies they make, they they make little boys dress like girls. The hairstyle is more like a girl. They dress like a girl. The, the, the dress they wear is uh, boys wear girlish and girlish wear boys. And they call the girl tomboy. And what else? I don't know. Where in the world we come to this thinking? And I'm talking about Christians. You know what's happening? Quickly we are embracing lies of the devil. Not the truth of the creator. And this game is lost already. In many fronts. You and I have to have a great. Acceptance of the reality. That our hearts are not truthful. Jeremiah 17.9. I said that already. Let me say it again. Our hearts are deceitful about all things. And desperately wicked, all right? Don't just tell yourself, I can trust my heart. I can believe in myself. No, you do it. You are doomed. You do the worst thing. We can't listen to ourselves. 
The only thing you can say about yourself, I'm a liar, I'm a cheat, I'm a deceiver, and I'm the greatest deceiver of all because I deceive myself to believe, to believe in myself. Believe in God. So we are going to have a camp, God willing, church camp, in June, and the theme will be have faith in God. Not faith in yourself, but have faith in God. Now this tendency to trust in our deceitful heart expresses, in its, uh, expresses itself with lying words. And sometimes we don't even realize we are lying because we are so prone to lie. We take it as fun. I remember when I was a small boy growing up and, you know, the children used to play certain games and they sometimes, in order to trick the fr friend, would swear to God. And they will say things like, I swear to God, or I say this, honest to God, I say. But then they have this trick up the sleeve. They will cross a finger, uh, you know, like this or like this. That means it's not true. Whatever you say is not true. So as long as you do this and say honest to God, you can tell lies. Right? There are many ways. So if you put your finger like that and say honest to God, then they say you are lying. You see your fingers? So what they do is they put behind the back or put under the table. Nobody can see. Say honest to God, let's go there. Or honest to God, we, we buy you sweets. But no, we have something else for him to beat him up or something. So, you see, this is the problem with the human heart. You don't have to be a Jewish Pharisee to do this. You understand? So let's don't sit here and say, only the Jews are oh, terrible people. We Christians, oh, no problem. Oh, it's in us. It's so quick. Recently, I was shocked by circumstances in which people are tend, to, tend to lie. So quick, so quick. Whether it's in the matters of business, or going through customs, what you have in your bag, about declaring this or that, everything we have a tendency to lie. Now, I know you don't have to tell uh, everybody about everything at all times. You don't tell your enemy uh, or the thief where you keep your money. So if the thief come around and ask you, where is your savings kept? Oh, I'm an honest man, come, I show you. I mean, that's crazy. You don't do that. You say, I'm not going to tell you. Or you escape. If you really cannot, then you have to tell them to save your, save your life. But you don't tell lies. Well, some people think it's okay to tell lies. I don't think so, because every, every lie you tell has its consequence. The Lord may forgive, I agree. We are all liars. We all lied many times, even after becoming Christians. And we believe the Lord is gracious to forgive us. Thank God he's faithful, because he says he's faithful and just to forgive if we confess our sins. So that's really wonderful. Thank God he is true. That's why we cannot even believe ourselves. Because we need forgiveness of a God who is faithful. Thank God our God is faithful. And he doesn't tell lies. So as Jesus demolishes the false standards raised by the Jews. Jesus is actually raising the truthfulness of God. And truthfulness of God's word. That's the best way to demolish our own wickedness. Every time when sin enters our heart, think about what, who God is and what he has spoken in his word. You raise the standard above yourself. You want to see how wicked you are and how you should repent? Raise yourself and see who God is and greatness of his truth then your own false standards will be demolished. And then you will have the spirit to cry, Lord, forgive me. Only in the, great, in the light of God's greatness, a sinner will see his sins. If God's light doesn't shine, you will live in your darkness, thinking that's normal. 
So let's pay attention to our God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Because what he says is going to bring us to the reality of our wretchedness. And I'm praying as we go through this that it will never be true about us of what Jesus said in Matthew 13, 15. For this people's heart is wax gross and their ears are dull of hearing and their eyes they have closed lest at any time they should see with their eyes or hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. That's Matthew 13, 15. A lot of the Jews who came to Christ had no heart to believe. They don't want to see. They don't want to hear. They hated Jesus for what, what he said. And may we never be like that. I know if you have a habit of living by telling lies and you make money out of lies about your product, you may not like this message. And you may say, oh, pastor thing is very great. You're just condemning everybody. Now, you have nothing to do with it. If I'm not careful, I'll be a lying pastor. There are long, so many lying pastors. Their only desire is to make money, not to glorify Christ. And they will say, oh, the Lord just spoke to me, brother. You are going to have a good job. <laughs> it's the devil who said, him, said to him. They never had a vision from God. They never had a dream from God. But to get some money out of this man, they cook up a story. A pastor's like that. Truly, I don't want that. But I'm aware I can be just like that or worse than that. And this is why I must honor my God and his word. So, my dear friends... I know it's difficult. There was a tax collector called Matthew. He was an extortioner. He took more than what he should. But when he met Jesus, he acknowledged his sin. Quickly, he left his trade. Yeah, he gave up his lifelong business. It was a business empire he built up. It was not easy to make friends with the Romans. And he made friendship with Romans and became a tax collector for them. And it's not easy to collect tax from the Jews who hated the Romans. And it's not easy to live in that land when the, the people hated the government. And that he was an extortioner. He was an amazing business maneuver. He made money. But out of all kinds of cheating, but when Jesus came, he acknowledged his sin, he gave up, he returned more than he collected. And the Lord blessed him. He became a great servant of Christ. So please pray. The Lord is confronting us. You have said this. You have heard of these kind of things. Your parents might have told this. Your tradition may have this kind of saying. But no, these are not our standards. So let's pray. Lord, then speak to my heart that I may be cleansed of the infections of sin and lies. Speak that we may discern thy blessed will, that we may rejoice to do them. I have no power, I have no wisdom. Teach me, Lord. That must be our prayer. You see, in verses 33 to 37, it's a very short passage. There are three major things that we need to keep in mind. First, the Lord talks about the law of God that has been explained throughout the centuries. You see that in verse 33. And then the Lord talks about the perversion of that truth by the Jewish tradition. And then the Lord tells us what's the right perspective of this truth. Okay, let's begin with the divine principle of honesty of speech, which is mentioned in verse 33. Jesus said, after saying this has been said by the people, but they said more than this. What he said in verse 34 and 35 uh, makes up what the people say. But the first part of it is the correct saying, uh, an integrated saying from the Old Testament scripture. And Jesus said, well, you say this, thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oath. Now, this is 
a very accurate statement. Nothing wrong about it. This is biblical. Well, you will not find the exact phraseology in the Old Testament. This is not a quotation from the Old Testament. But this is a summation of divine truths in the Old Testament. Thou shalt not forswear thyself. Now, forswear is an old English word which actually means perjure or uh, tell a lie. You know, willfully telling an untruth. Forswear means you tell a truth under, I mean, you tell a lie under oath. Or you put up your hand and say, I'm telling uh, the truth, nothing but the truth, and then you tell a lie. That's forswear. So thou shalt not forswear thyself. Thou shalt not, in other words, making misrepresentation under oath. Don't do that. So no perjury, no telling lies under oath. That is what God says. So when he says, thou shalt not forsake thyself, but shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. The word oath comes from the Greek word horkos, which has the idea of binding something or strengthening something. So oath actually means that you add something to what you said to strengthen that statement. If I say, I'm a Christian, well, there's a statement. By itself, it's correct. But when you say it under oath, you add something to that statement to make it really uh, firm and strong. So I say, by, in the name of Christ, I say I'm a Christian. So that's an oath I take. So this is man evoking God or invoking God to attest the validity of his statement. That's what an oath is. Invoking God to attest to the validity of one's word. Now, if, if I were to give you a biblical example of it, uh, I will take your attention to Hebrews 6.16. Would you please go there very quickly? We will come back here. So put a finger here and turn to Hebrews 6.16. Hebrews 6.16 says, For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Now, this is a biblical principle that the writer of Hebrews brings to the attention of the people. He says, for men verily or truly swear by the greater. You see, when you want to prove a point, you don't call on something weaker or lesser than you. You call on something greater. That's why, you know, the Jews have this habit of swearing by the temple or the things in the temple or by the city, all means certain things. I will explain that later. But it has to be something greater than yourself. You know, it's not very, very acceptable in, 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 in the human society generally, and particularly among the Jews. If a man say, I swear by my slave, nobody bothers. It means nothing. You know. But if you say, I swear by the temple, or by the priestly system, now, that means some credibility. Naturally, people do this. Even in modern court system, if you are in the court for whatever reason, and in, before the judge, when you make a statement, they will ask you whether you're a religious person. If you're a Christian, then place your hand on the Bible and say that you are going to tell the truth. Right? It's a common thing. Or some people say, I'm not a religious person. I put my hand on my heart. In other words, I swear by my life. 
This is everything to me. And so some people do that. Well, so men swear by something greater so that oath may be confirmed. And when that is done, strife is over. In other words, okay, you have told the truth. Now, I don't, I'm not going to tr trouble you. Many years ago, I had a very, very painful experience of being confronted by a fellow minister of the gospel. He was told uh, wrongly by someone that I have announced to this congregation uh, something about him, which never happened. So we were both in the Changi airport to see off another minister who came to preach to this church and that pastor's church. So both of us met in the airport. I had nothing in my heart and I knew something that happened and I did react to it in a different way. But I didn't know that he, this particular minister, a Singaporean minister who was a friend of mine, would come to the airport with very great bitterness. I had no idea. When he, we came together, he refused to greet me. He refused to look at me. I scratched my head and said, what's wrong? This one doesn't look good. And I sense some trouble. My wife was with me. And the other pastor noticed. Uh, he is from Australia. And he saw, saw everything happened. And uh, at the gate when this Australian pastor was going into the immigration, uh, he waved hands and said bye. And the other pastor from Singapore is standing next to me. And my wife is on this side. And. As soon as this Australian pastor went toward the counter, immigration counter, this gentleman turned to me and said, put his finger like this on my face. And he said, you be careful what you say. I said, oh brother, what happened? Calm down. The police, you know, the immigration police, they are standing and looking at us. I said, it's embarrassing. You put your finger down and you talk to me. It's okay. I will explain, you know. If I've done anything wrong, I will explain or I will say sorry, but don't be so agitated. Wait. He wouldn't. He put my fing his finger closer to my face. You know, at that moment, I thank God I'm a Christian and the Spirit of God is with me. I, when I was a young boy or young teenager, I can't take this kind of provocation. I will really break his finger. And that's how hot-tempered I was. I used to be that way. I don't want to explain to you what I did when I was a young man. It's not joyful. But anyway, so I said, a hey, brother, come. And my wife was very, very troubled by his behavior. I said, come, let's move toward that side. And when I looked through the glass door, I can see the Australian pastor saw all this, you know, the finger on my face. He said, <laughs> he went through the immigration. He stood behind the immigration desk and asking us what happened. Later on, he called me on my mobile phone and explained to him, and we had a lot of laughter about it. And so I said, okay, let's talk. What's wrong? And this, this gentleman is about a few years older than me. However, he was my student in the Bible college. I was his lecturer because he was called much later in life. And he was my student. And he again put his finger... A third time, and this time with greater viciousness. One to fight me like that. Uh, I just couldn't believe it. And I said again, okay. Now I know what, what you said. I put my hand up like this. My wife was, I said, God is my witness. I did not say what you are saying. He wouldn't give up. Second time, I put up my hand. He still wouldn't stop. Third time, I put up my hand and said, last time I'm telling you, God is my witness. If you do not believe me and try to keep this anger against me, God will deal with you. God is my witness. He calmed down. He said, oh, it's okay. Um, I, I said, if you doubt this, why don't you write to our church session our elders were there. Our deacons were in there. I spoke in public, isn't it? So let them witness to you whether I said such a thing. Oh, it's okay. I said, all right. 
But this is a serious thing because you are so angry. Why don't you tell me, how do you come to know about this? You were not in my church. Who told you this? I won't tell you. I said, why is that you're protecting that person? He's a liar. You got to tell me who said that. No, I won't tell you. I said, then I can't do anything. There's nothing I can do. I can do anything about it. But I had to call on my God to soften his anger. Otherwise, my nose may break. I don't know. Or I may lose my cool also. I don't know. But it's very provocative. Terribly. I remember Reverend Timothy told, my principal in college told us a story. This was in the days when Forreston Bible College was being built. He went away for some missions. When he came back, some of the session members accused him that he gave wrong instruction to the construction workers, the, the mason and all that. And because the whole problem was created because the mason did something he was not supposed to do. He built uh, certain walls that shouldn't be there. And the mason was saying it's because pastor has told him that. But Ravanto said, I never give such an instruction. Why should I? When I'm the one who suggested the other one, why should I give him this instruction? This man is not listening to the plan and he's not giving, paying attention to the drawings. He's just doing by himself. But some session members don't believe the pastor. They would rather believe the mason. And Reverend Timothy just said this to us in the class. He put up his hand and that's where I learned this. <laughs> he put up his hand and said, to the session member, his own session member. I never said such a thing to him. Then they calmed down. It's very strange sometimes this is a case. I cannot blame people also because we are all liars, you know. It's very hard to convince a man that I'm telling the truth. It all takes a one smart fellow to somehow collate a few situations that you are in and make people believe. I have been attacked, even people by, in this church, which caused the session members to meet with that man, a young man who went to full-time ministry, and told everybody that I said to him, if he, his wife work, the church will not support him. Now, this is easy for people to believe. You know why? Because I take a view that if you have a child, the mother's first duty is to look after the child. It's not the maid's duty. If you leave your children to the maids, they are going to be lost somewhere sometime. Mothers must look after. It's a biblical teaching, and I believe it. So the, he, this guy somehow tapped on that teaching and told the people, even the interim committee at that time, not session were troubled by that statement. I had to request that we, the leaders of the church, meet with this man. And in that meeting, he said, I told him that we church will not support him. And I said, brother, I never talked to you like that. He said, no, in that coffee shop, when we had coffee together, you said. Then I smiled and said, well, I remember that meeting. I know I'm the one who took you for the coffee. I'm the one who bought the coffee for you. But unfortunately, I drank the coffee, you cannot bear witness. And the coffee, uh, the, sorry, the cup and the saucer don't have mouth. <laughs> I said this in the meeting. I don't know whether the, the committee members remember this. And I said, but let me tell you something. In that committee meeting, I put up my hand and I said, God is my witness. I never said it. And you tell this lie, let the Lord deal with you. His face changed red. Next sentence, I think pastor didn't say. This happened in this church. And that man is no more in the ministry. I heard from another pastor, he's mentally deranged for a while. I still pray for him that he will change. You know, we people, in order to get advantage in life. We are very good in reading what we want to read and listening what we want to listen to. We don't listen fully. We don't read fully because we want to take advantage of the situation for our benefit. 
And this makes parents very afraid of trusting their own children. Wives find it difficult to ha trust their husbands. Bosses find it difficult to trust their employees. Pastors are not trusted. Neither pastors do trust people around them. This is the commotion that we have. Isn't it true? Isn't it true? Why? Because we ourselves know we are liars. We know we will easily give into lie. So we cannot trust one another. It's a big problem. And so, in time, man has learned to swear. Man has learned to take oath. They will call on something greater than themselves in order to say, if I'm telling a lie, let this happen to me. Now, so if something has to happen to you, it has to be some, the witness has to be someone who is greater than you. Then only that, ca that person can act against you. If somebody who is lesser than you, the person cannot bring any consequence to you. Are you with me? And that's why in he Hebrews 6, we read, we swear by something greater. Now, when God gives us promise, do you know something? He also took oath. Not that there's a necessity for him to do it. You see, there are two reasons why he doesn't have to take oath. At least two reasons. Very obvious reasons. There are more, but let me give you two. One, he is a God of truth. There's no need to take an oath. And then two, there is no one greater than him. You understand? Because there's none greater than God, why should God take an oath? And yet he did. Read verse 17 of Hebrews 6. See what it says. Hebrews 6, 17. And this is amazing. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. You see that? God confirmed this promise by an oath. Why, you ask? Because of our unbelieving heart. We are such liars, we won't even trust God. You understand? When a man says, I don't trust what God says, I know his heart is deceived and he doesn't even realize how deceived he is. That's a fact. That's a fact. It's not intelligence. You know, some people think, I don't believe what, what the Bible says. I reject it. They think they're very smart. They are fools. They have deceived themselves. They don't even realize the deceitfulness into which they have fallen. They are so smart to use the mind to argue, 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 argue. But they, realize, they don't realize they are arguing against one who knows everything and he is telling the truth. And still they argue. And thus, they make themselves so great, so clever, so smart, as though they got all the facts correctly interpreted. And so God said, being very gracious, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel. The reason why the Lord took an oath is to say that there is no variableness, there is no change, immutable. He is steadfast and faithful. His words, his counsels are immutable. So God said, I take this oath. Now the question is, upon what did God take his oath? Let me give you a very interesting verse at this time. Would you turn with me to the book of Genesis, chapter 22, verse 16. Genesis 22, verse 16. This is an illustration of that point. Reading Genesis 22, 16. And said, by myself... Have I sown, saith the Lord. 
for by myself. Because there's none greater than him. By himself. Do you know why Jesus died for you? You know why? Because he made a covenant with you. That's a covenant of life and death. If you break it, you must die. But then God bound himself to you by saying, I will give you life. So instead of you dying, he died for you to keep the covenant. He saw by himself. When God lovingly chose us before the foundation of the world, it was not because he thought you have the moral capacity to be righteous or become a Christian by yourself. No, you couldn't. But because he loved you, he swore by himself to save you. And so he took death on himself. And of course, because he's great, almighty God, he came out of the grave just as he said on the third day. I swear by my own name. So my dear friends, listen to this very carefully. So often when our Lord Jesus spoke, he would say, you know this, verily, verily, I say unto you. What does that mean? The word is amen, amen, or amen, amen. What does that mean? Truly, truly. Amen means truly, truly. So Jesus is God of truth. And he often said that. Amen, amen. And then he goes and say a great statement that we should believe and subscribe to. He's the God of truth. And same God has taught us some great things about when we are questioned when our integrity is put in great uh, doubt, we should serve unto the faithfulness and truthfulness of God that we serve by swearing in his name. Now, I know the word swearing today has a different meaning in some context. You say, he swore, that means he has said some bad words, some vulgarities. So today, vulgar speech is sometimes referred to as swearing. That's not what it means here. It means taking an oath, okay? Let's turn to a few Bible passages. Deuteronomy 6.13. Deuteronomy 6.13. What do you read? Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shall swear by his name. Shall swear by his name. Do you know something? When you come to worship God, don't you think that you can lie to God? Every time when you come and say, in Jesus' name I worship you, that's a swearing. In his name. There is no greater name than the name of Jesus Christ. It's the name of the King of Kings. He's a creator. He's a coming judge. When you come to offer sacrifices to God, when you praise Him, when you pray, when you make your commitments to God, it has to be truthful. Otherwise, you are a false worshiper. This must send a chill into our hearts. How often we have taken worship for granted with pretentious hearts. We sit here. We sing, oh, I love you, but in the heart, I love money, Lord. Give me more money, I love you. Love your God with all your heart and all your strength. But we are not able to love him. So what should be our prayer? Lord, teach me to love. I'm sorry. It was part and parcel of true worship to take an oath. That we will love him. You can't say, I dare not take an oath because uh, I think I will break it. So I don't want to take an oath. I will never say to God, I will love him. I will never say to him, I will believe him. I will never say that I will follow him. There are very smart people like this in the church who refuse to take the vows. And I, one gentleman some years back confronted me here 
we were worshiping on the other side of this building. And he said, you know, Pastor Kushi, you said, Bible says swear. I cannot swear. I said, where in the Bible? Jesus said, cannot swear. I said, Jesus said, don't swear, false swearing. Thou shalt not forswear. He didn't say you cannot swear. The Bible says swear. The entire Bible belongs to Christ. So you go and read. By the way, if you have any question about it, if you're familiar with Westminster Confession of Faith, which is a standard of our faith, go and read this. Uh, one whole chapter on religious vows and oaths, and you must read it. It's biblical. It's part of worship. So this man came around and said, Oh, you taught that we can swear in the name of the Lord. I said, Yes. And he said, I would never do it. I said, You never do it? I thought you did it. No. No. I said, Sure. Yes. I said, I can prove to you, did. No, you will never prove. I said, call your wife. You call your wife. So wife came. She said, did your husband took a vow during the wedding? <laughs> yes, pastor. I said, sir, what do you do? <laughs> oh, I, I forgot. <laughs> I forgot. Then I asked his wife, would you marry him on the wedding day if he refused to give that vow? Of course no, no, pastor. <laughs> How to trust him? Even now I have a problem. <laughs> That's what she said. Come on, don't talk big, okay? The Bible says, swear and serve your God. You swear yourself unto God and pray, pray Lord, I know I can fall fall into temptation. I know I can forget my, my vow to thee, but, O oh Lord, whom shall I go to? Thou art the only Savior. I would love you. It is with humility and prayer we trust him. That's what we trust him. We don't trust in ourselves. Religion got nothing to do with your ability and my ability, but it has everything to trust him to help us to keep our vow to him. We vow because he vowed himself to us. That's all. It's only a natural response. We love him because he first loved us. True? Who started loving? You or God? Of course God loved you first. Natural response to it is love. When the husband say to the wife, with my body, I, I'm, I thee wed. And the wife after that would say, with my body, I thee wed. It's a response to the husband's affirmation of his commitment to the wife. It's not the other way around. Husband take lead. Christ is the head of the church. He is the bridegroom. He is our husband. He's coming soon because he promised. So shall we not say, Lord, we love thee because you loved us. And that we are adulterous in our heart. We tend to wander away from thee. Forgive us. Keep us to thyself. Help us to believe. Help my unbelief. Increase my faith. That I may not go back on my word. Our time is up. We'll come back and study the same topic next week. Tell then, remember this. We are liars. We don't know how to tell the truth. We deceive ourselves day and night. But our God is able to help us. We look to him. He, we raise his name great about us. We honor him as God of truth. We believe all that he said in his promises, in his counsels, in his commandments are true. Oh Lord, help us. Help us to believe thy truth. What the Jews did is this. Listen to this. Let me conclude by this. The Jews tried to desecrate the, the commandment of God by saying, oh, you can actually tell a lie if you raise the standard of your oath. In other words, don't say by heaven, but say by temple. If it's a little bit more greater lie, then don't say by temple, say by the priest's garment. Uh, you know, if, it is no, if, if it's more lie, then don't say by priest's garment, say it by Jerusalem, the city, la, city, you know, a lot of other people also. So make it away from the greatest so you can swear with false intentions. That's not what God said. God said, fear him, love him, serve him. Keep your heart attuned to him. Let us seek his help in prayer. Let's pray. Father, how pure are thy words. 
and how wicked are our hearts. We are liars. We are deceivers. We are miserable of all men. Oh, wretched man that I am. Even the great prophet Isaiah cried out, Oh, woe unto me, I am a man of unclean lips. Truly, Lord, you know how wicked we are. How many times we said we will love you? How many times we said we will pray to you? How many times we said we will meditate upon thy word? And yet we found ourselves shamelessly walking away from our spiritual duties. Not only in our duties to thee, but also in our duties to one another, we have failed. Forgive us, O Lord. We thank you that Jesus exposes our sins that we may see how much we need his help. And we want to say sincerely, abide by us, O God, that we may abide by thee. That your truth may help us to keep our hearts humble and be prayerful. Thank you for thy word. We have tasted it and we have seen thy greatness. And so we humble ourselves once again to sing praise to thee as we come to the end of this service. Also be with, we, with us as we remember the Lord's table. Bless us with thy presence. In Jesus' name. Amen.